Like I've never done cocaine, but I imagined at one point when I was a kid playing with my RoboCop toys that eventually I would grow up to do cocaine off of two uh, women's breasts. And that still hasn't no. happened for me. No, it's a waste. You're, you're going to lose half of it down to dress. <laughs> Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane came down. Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question, were the movies we loved when growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you even remember what Blockbuster Video was? If you answered yes, and this is the podcast for you, I'm one of your three co-hosts. I don't know how, I, how I'm back here, but I am <laughs> Roger Roper. And alongside me are my two co-hosts, Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And Gene, ED209 Lions. Dick, I'm very disappointed. And each week, the audience selects from six movie choices that would then break out a race car VHS tape rewinder and watch the movie that tallied the highest number of votes. At the end of each podcast, the three of us will provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. It's how we help the podcast grow. You can also check out our sister podcast, Chat on TV, where we review television series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, True Detective, and Game of Thrones is there anything I'm missing there? Is that have we added any <laughs> since I've left? I didn't. Uh, Thirteen reasons on Netflix. Nothing. Nothing worth mentioning. <laughs> you can download Shat the Movies via iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Pandora, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are found. That being said, Big D, what are we doing tonight? Well, tonight's a glorious night, and this is it's a little deja vu because in the Shat the Movies history, this is only the second movie that has been lost to a technical issue. So Roger and I recorded, it was probably like our eighth recording ever for my cousin, Vinny. <laughs> you didn't miss anything. You didn't no, miss it was, anything. It was, it, was, it was rough. That one was lost because Roger had this bad echo. Then we recorded RoboCop probably about two months ago. And thankfully that recording was lost to a technical <laughs> glitch as well. Uh, so we are back here today visiting this classic. And this was a commission uh, by Paul Dixon, and Paul made a generous contribution. And I wasn't sure if it was for a movie or it was for just to help us keep the lights on. So he wrote back and said, hey, Big D, this was actually just to help keep the lights on. I'm a big fan of all your podcasts, and I feel guilty listening for free. Although if I were to commission a movie, it would be RoboCop, which you guys have mentioned you may be doing anyway. I didn't see RoboCop in the theater, but it was on heavy rotation on my VCR in the 90s. I love the mix of serious social commentary, crime and corruption, with humor, newscasts, and commercials. Come to think of it, that's why I like your podcast. <laughs> Great quotable quotes to use in my everyday life, like, you have 20 seconds to comply. Good business is where you find it. And of course, I'd buy that for a dollar. So that was Paul Dixon. Paul, thank you very much for the uh, generous contribution. If you want to see the schedule of what's coming up, you can go to shatthemovies.com forward slash events. And we have everything scheduled out through July. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what next week is because we keep it a bit of a surprise. But uh, the week after, it's Demolition Man, The Sandlot's coming up, Videodrome, Escape from New York, Best of Jim Carrey, and The Best of Roger Roper. So uh, you can check that out, shatthemovies.com forward slash events, and, and get a heads up. Yeah. So I, I've been gone away. You guys have been on hiatus while you you did all the massive coverage over at Game of Thrones, which I have to congratulate you um for such a shitty season eight and it's i'm <laughs> i'm like i'm so glad i'm not on the podcast because you guys i was following you and the, the, you were like the only positive podcast how did you guys stay away from all the negativity i think for me i and i've said this on the pod and i've responded to a lot of people via email is that i had already kind of given up hope in season seven <laughs> Right. So, so in season seven, like people seem to have not remember that weird shit was happening in season seven. So they're like season eight. They're like, I'm shocked and dismayed. I'm like, no, nah, this is pretty normal for Game of Thrones, yeah. but I don't mind. Yeah. No, I figured. I think what it was that helped us was we don't do a breakdown of scene by scene. If we yeah, had done true. that, then oh, we yeah. would have been like, oh, what the fuck is that? What? Oh, is it snowing? Is that ash? Come on. But by being able to pick a topic, we were able to do fun things like break down the strategy of the the long night. 
if we went down scene by scene, we would have been in there with everybody else and probably just been negative way too much. Yeah. Well, you know, it's so funny because we were getting all set up here for the podcast and it was like that scene in, I don't know if it was Back to the Future 3 where they like shove off the canvas of like the old DeLorean and get it back up and running on the, on the trails. But that's what it felt like in powering up my computer and my my mixer here tonight. Um, how long has it been since we released an original content? Shat the movies together. All three of us. It's It's been a while. I don't know. I think it was like 2018. Oh, jeez. Jeez. Yeah, I'm still amazed that people are paying. I'm so, I'm still amazed that people are sending in $100. Uh, but anyway, thank you, Paul, so much for commissioning RoboCop. I think I was really excited uh, to come back and, and be able to do this. So um, RoboCop is a 1987 American cyberpunk action film directed by Paul Verhoeven. The film stars Peter Weller, Nancy Allen, Dan O'Hurley, Kurt Woodsmith, Miguel Ferrer, and Ronnie Cox. It's set in a crime-ridden Detroit, Michigan in the near not too distant future RoboCop centers on police officer Alex Murphy played by Peter Weller, who is murdered by a gang of criminals and subsequently revived by mega corporation, Omni consumer products, better known as OCP themes that make up the basis of RoboCop does include media influence, gentrification, corruption, authoritarianism, greed, privatization, capitalism, identity, dystopia, and human nature. It received positive reviews and cited as one of the best films of 1987, spawning a franchise that included merchandise, two sequels, a television series, a remake, two animated TV series, a television miniseries, video games, and a number of comic book adaptations and crossovers. Guys, if you haven't seen the animated series for TV, you don't even need to watch it. Just Google RoboCop cartoon. He's like cuddling puppies. It's the <laughs> like they, they try to make it funny. It's like womp womp RoboCop. I don't yeah. know, why the fuck do they have to animate everything? It's ridiculous. The film itself, the original RoboCop, was produced for a relatively modest $13 million. And the honors for the film include five Saturn Awards, two BAFTA Award nominations, and the Academy Award for Best Sound Editing, along with nominations for Best Film Editing and Best Sound Mixing. That's crazy uh, because I did not know that it won awards. Um, I just remember this movie being part of my childhood. Big D, what are your memories of this movie? Where were you when you first saw RoboCop? Well, as a senior member of the podcast, I was 13 when this came out. And the uh, the ushers at the movie theater at the Mamaronic Playhouse 4, they were a little bit more attentive. So I couldn't get into this. So I was forced to wait for HBO. Uh, and then wait, of course, for my parents to be asleep and find on TV. But as a kid whose parents owned a Ford Taurus, and I was embarrassed <laughs> about my Ford Taurus, as soon as I saw that the whole futuristic, the world of 2030, right. all the Detroit police officers, they drive a Ford Taurus. I was like, fuck yeah, my parents are hip. Yeah, This movie predicted the future much better than other <laughs> movies, and it was like a two-hour commercial for the durability of the Ford Taurus. Would you go to school every day and be like, you guys, you guys know what's cooler than a DeLorean? <laughs> Ford Taurus. <laughs> I tried to tell all my friends at school that Knight Rider was a Toyota Celica because that's what my mom drove. <laughs> and I think they were just humoring me. They're like, yeah, okay, cool. And I would literally I would literally sit in the car while my mom was driving me to school and go, whoa, 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 whoa. Nice. Fucking kids are stupid. <laughs> I always always wanted like the A-Team van. Or like the, I, st the, I still want the A-Team van. The, van. the closest I ever got to my parents having as cool of a an A-Team van was the extended Ford Aerostar. You know, the big, <laughs> the big giant Ford Aerostar. I took that to prom once. My date was not happy whatsoever. Wait, like how many siblings do you have? I had one sibling. And you needed that much van? Well, my stepfather, he sold medical equipment. So he needed all this, all the space to, I guess put ekg machines in the back <laughs> also we had a rottweiler so that was like my sibling and so they wanted space for him in the back ford aerostar vans i can actually appreciate yeah. that <laughs> where were you gene when you first saw robocop uh, much like big d i wasn't old enough to actually get into an r-rated movie so my big cousin who is 12 years older than i am uh he had actually he'd been in the country two years he had gotten to the u.s from pakistan and uh, he was like, we got to go see this RoboCop movie. So he snuck me into the theater. It was one of the most exciting nights of my life. My, not, my mom never would have allowed this. And it was crazy because if you think about this movie for a seven-year-old, like there were things on the screen that my mind could not comprehend. <laughs> and I, I really emerged from the theater a changed person. We'll, I'll get into that later in the pod. But like 
there's a lot of things I saw for the first time here. And I was like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> and afterward, I found out. Wait a minute. You have a cousin from Pakistan? Well, no, he's from Iran, but you can't go straight from Iran to the U.S. You got to <laughs> yeah. go to Pakistan, Spain, and then U.S. So would you say Pakistan is threatening my border? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Guys, it's it's like it's like we never left. Uh, I definitely remember <laughs> this being a big part of my childhood. Again, I watched it. If you've ever listened to the podcast, I tell the story about my neighbor who had the black box and would record movies off of HBO. That's where I watched this movie. Um, I believe this is a perfect example of an 80s movie that was originally targeted at, at adults but became an obsession for children. As we mentioned, I remember this being so heavily directed at children. I remember I remember the cartoons. You can look them up on YouTube. In between cartoons of RoboCop, there would be the toys that you could be RoboCop. And I so wanted to be RoboCop. I remember I remember like my head exploding when I heard they were going to make a comic book about RoboCop versus the Terminator or RoboCop versus the alien. Like there were all these crossovers that I, like gave 12 year old Roger a little boner in his underoos. No, you have no idea. I started watching a behind the scenes. There was some kind of a cross promotion between the Boy Scouts and RoboCop. <laughs> and RoboCop. <laughs> so I saw I saw a black and white video of Rudy Giuliani, uh, a bad bad copy of RoboCop and a bunch of Boy Scouts. I really don't know what it was about. I couldn't even go research it, but they somehow thought that RoboCop was a good role model for kids. That sounds like my nightmare, Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> a black and white tape of RoboCop and a bunch of Boy Scouts. There's no way that goes right. No, 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 not at all. All right. Well, if you've never seen the movie, we're going to break down the plot for you and talk about it. Um, we're also going to play the trailer. Big D, do that now. We get the best of both worlds. The fastest reflexes modern technology has to offer onboard computer assisted memory and a lifetime of on the street law enforcement programming. It is my great pleasure to present to you. Robocop. Not a guy, he's a machine. Old Detroit has a cancer. <laughs> cancer is crime. Let the woman go, you are under arrest. <laughs> you, you better back up, pal! Just your move, <laughs> creep. What are your prime directives? You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to an attorney. What is this shit? Anything you say may be used against you. He's a cyborg, you idiot. He recorded every word you said. You're dead. We killed you. His memory is admissible as evidence. You're going to have to kill it. Get out of the car, for God's sake! <laughs> RoboCop, the future of law enforcement. In a dystopian future, Detroit is struggling with financial ruin and a high crime rate. The mayor signs a deal with the mega corporation Omni Consumer Products, giving it complete control of the underfunded Detroit Police Department. And in exchange, OCP will be allowed to turn the rundown sections of Detroit into a high end utopia called Delta City. OCP's Senior Vice President Richard Dick Jones proposes assisting the police with the ED-209 law enforcement droid, and at its first demonstration, it malfunctions and kills an executive. Robert Bob Morton uses the opportunity to introduce his own design, RoboCop, to Jones's anger. The company chairman, referred to as the old man, approves Bob Morton's plan. So this was Paul Verhoeven's first big U.S. movie. And Paul subsequently would do some great movies that we love, like Starship Troopers, uh, Total Recall, Showgirls. He's done some good ones. <laughs> all, and we all, all of them have been covered on this podcast. You can go back and listen to them. Yeah, so you know they're quality movies. And all of those have a couple <laughs> things in common. Co-ed naked progressive showers, which yes. is fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they also use like television news reports, commercials, uh, some like war footage in world to try to kind of let you see what's going on. And it does a great job to catch you up quickly to the world of 2030. Uh, I missed all the news reports in Showgirls. 
Where were all the breaking news reports? Oh, what are you kidding me? Where they were talking about <laughs> Nomi, about when she gets the gig. Hey, Nomi is now. Oh, the that's big- right. Yes. Wait a minute. You're right. You're absolutely yeah. correct. I completely forgot about that. Where they have mm-hmm. she's on the red carpet. There, it's a commercial yeah. for Las Vegas. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Oh my god. The whole movie is shockingly accurate as it comes to like a portrayal of the future. And we've seen a lot of movies that are kind of like portrayals of the dystopian future, and they get some stuff right and stuff some some stuff wrong. But it, almost an undershooting what they expected from the future, they really got it absolutely right. So Verhoeven, you know, they're showing stuff like, uh, you know, these really short attention spans, uh, commercialization of medicine, you know, having ads for like medical procedures, the militarization of the police uniforms, you know, instead of being like the friendly neighborhood cop, it was those, you know, the jumpsuits, the dark color jumpsuits with the body armor. All this stuff is like, it's coming true now. And in 87, we thought, wow, that's a, that's a really dismal view of the future, but <laughs> yeah. fucking here we are. Uh, do you think our current president could make it all the way to the International Space Station? I don't think they have a spacesuit that'll fit them, but that would make sense <laughs> when they have the, the misfire and take out you know, Santa Barbara. Listen, before you write in with your angry emails, uh, all spacesuits are, I think, are designed for people five, nine and under. Yeah, that's what we mean. Like, I think astronauts are like jockeys is what we're saying. Yeah, it's like Tom Cruise's size. Anybody bigger, you can't. You can. And also, Donald Trump is fat. <laughs> like he's like he's fat. I'm sorry. Yeah, he's I mean fat. he's a big guy. Yeah, yeah, he's gonna clog. He's gonna clog the airlock. Yeah, we're not talking about like politically. We're just talking about a physical body. You can love the guy, but you have to admit he's <laughs> he's not he's, he's not he's, getting on that space station. Yeah, anytime he's, soon. He's, he's he's not getting in the airlock. <laughs> but but the movie is violent as fuck. It really yeah, it is, really does. and it, and it goes over the top. It took 11 tries for them to cut and resubmit it before it got an R. It was an X. What we've seen is toned down violence. And it is so over the top, it actually becomes funny. But as a kid, I don't remember. I just remember being shocked when Ed 209, for some reason, they loaded him with live ammo for this in boardroom demo. He unloads on poor Kinney. And it's like, and I'm like, stop, stop. He keeps shooting them. It was glorious. What I didn't realize is that Amazon Prime late last year, they put it on their, their prime video and they actually released the original director's cut. They, they, re- they released the X rated version. Which version have you seen? Have you seen the X rated version? It, it exists out there. I've only seen the, the regular R rated theatrical release in the US. I haven't seen any other ones, but I'd like to. I mean, I saw a couple clips. And it's such a joke because it's not like anything big that was removed that changed it. It's like a, a fraction of a second here, two seconds here. One okay. of the big scenes is where, not spoiler alert, but where they execute him. And finally, uh, Clarence gives him the headshot. In the X-rated version, you see the back of his head. And you can see the bullet enter his head and then it quickly cuts. In what we saw in the R-rated, it's the shot and you don't see it hit him in the head. So it's so tiny, but come on. Yeah, I mean, listen. The from what I understand, my, you're 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 absolutely correct. The execution scene of um, Murphy, the, the, who eventually become RoboCop, when he's being assassinated by all the thugs, that I guess scene is elongated. There's there's a little bit more over the top gratuitous violence. Um, have you ever seen the series our remake of then blank movie? It's, it's on the web. It's on YouTube, where a bunch of different film creators will recreate like a minute of a scene or two minutes of a movie. And then they'll all put it together. Have you, have you seen this? Have you heard about this? I still haven't seen Chernobyl. So (laughs) I'm a little behind on things. So, so Google this, it's called uh, our RoboCop remake scene 27, not to jump ahead here, but there's a scene where RoboCop uh, stops a rape from occurring. There's these two thugs. They're chasing down the woman and he shoots uh, the, the guy's dick. Well, in this in this remake, it's it's satire. It's fun. It's slapstick humor. They recreate that scene, but then they bring on like another two thugs, and one of the thugs has his penis out, and RoboCop, like you see, like the sh- the close up shot of the bullet exploding the dick, and then like, and then another two group of individuals enter the scene with another woman, and his penis is out, and RoboCop shoots his penis, and it just becomes an ongoing scene of penises exploding on screen. It's the greatest thing ever. I highly recommend it. We should put a link in the show notes. Yes, it's just a minor edit, you know. It's just a small a change. Edit, just small change. Small change. That's right. Uh, is this one going to play out better than your uh, Rick and Morty video <laughs> about licking balls? Are people going to like this one more? Well, no one shoots them off. It's a little bit more romantic in Rick and Morty. But the creators of Ed 209 and this whole like 
corporation that is taking over police departments. In fact, I looked it up. This is happening in Detroit now. Again, this movie has predicted everything that comes true. But how soon until you think multinational corporations take over social services like the fire department and uh, and the police? Could you imagine if, 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 we ha- if Orlando was policed by Disney? Well, they kind of are already. <laughs> I mean, for me, having lived in the Midwest, especially, and kind of in that Rust Belt area, like places like Lima, Ohio, you do see this sort of thing happening. And what it is essentially is places like Detroit are prime candidates. And, and you saw it in, uh, in Wisconsin, too, with the Foxconn yeah. factory. Yeah. is Basically, the thing is, if you got a place that's struggling for money, they're, they're struggling to make ends meet, and you have these companies willing to pour in money to do research or, or run things, uh, it's, it's very, very tempting. So uh, it's strange that it like you never think it would get to as far as like having an Ed 209 patrolling your streets. <laughs> right. But, but having worked in Lima and seeing the kind of things that like, say, the Joint Systems Manufacturing uh, Center and different big industrial plants get away with, it, it's pretty shocking. And one of the things that they they point out in the movie, because like originally I thought, well, why are they going to municipality police departments? Like, and I didn't remember that originally they say in the boardroom, like this is all for some big military contract. Yeah. So ironically, the whole Ed 209 test that they do in the boardroom, they, they mention in a great piece of satire that they're testing it for military applications. So like, why do they not do it out in the military <laughs> yeah. versus doing it in the boardroom? Right. And then they go like, they go a step further, like at 209, like growls. And you got to think that this is not that uncommon because people don't like flee the boardroom. They're still just sticking around, like trying to check out what went wrong with Ed. I'm like, I'd get the fuck. I'd be jumping out a window. I don't care. Oh, well, Officer Alexander James, or Alex Murphy, joins the force and becomes partners with Officer Ann Lewis on their first patrol. They chase a gang of criminals led by the notorious Clarence Boddicker. Boddicker's gang hides in an abandoned steel mill where Murphy and Lewis separate on foot to find them. Murphy kills one of them and attempts to arrest another, but he is caught by Boddicker. The gang tortures Murphy, brutally gunning him down. He is declared dead, and OCP selects him as a RoboCop candidate. They replace most of his body with cybernetics, leaving only his human brain, and RoboCop is programmed with four prime directives, including to serve the public trust, protect the innocent, uphold the law, but he's left unaware of the classified fourth directive. So when we recorded this originally, Kerry Gross was on the podcast. It was a very different podcast. Kerry broke down how they brought in consultants from a hospital to get the procedures done when they are trying to revive Murphy. But I'm fucking sorry. I appreciate the fact that you're trying to save his life, but he took a head wound. Part of his brain is missing in the back. They're giving him CPR. Wouldn't we want to bandage that giant wound in his head first? Well, you know, when Abraham Lincoln, when he was shot in the back of the head, he lived for like 12 hours. Um, They actually carried his body down the Ford Theater across the street into a residence where doctors and physicians tried to put his head back together. Um, But I think there was also like a a lot of pressure is building up. So you have to like expand, you have to like release the blood as well. So they drilled another hole in Lincoln's head. Anyway, if you go to the Ford theater, you go across the street, they still have the pillow with the blood. Yeah. But but I don't think a a black powder muzzle loaded, like pistol (laughs) doesn't have the same kick. Sick, simper, tyrannus. (laughs) Yeah. That's what he yells. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that uh, that <laughs> I don't think that John Wilkes Booth like stood over his body and went no 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 tracked the shotgun. But but it's amazing that this this torture scene I remember rattled me as a kid and it still has that effect on me. It, it's just shocking to me that a movie that was made in 1987 still has that shock factor to make people look away from the screen in 2019. I had a hard time. Uh, you know, as an adult w- sitting through and watching the entire scene. And, I, and I've watched it with other people before that were like, how can you watch this shit? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's really, really shocking. And again, Big D, you talked about kind of the medical procedures that they did. Yeah, they glammed it up a bit to really focus on the more horrific parts of uh, of the attempts to resuscitate him. But it is a it is uh, it's really Verhoeven at his best in, in shocking people. Now, Gene, you're a gun owner. Big D, you were in the military. If if I were to take a shotgun and aim it at your left hand or your right hand and blow, like, would it blow off at close range? Would it, would it have that explosion factor? I mean, it depends on the, the size of the shot. So when you're using a shotgun, the, the buckshot comes in, you, you can go basically like bird shot where it's like very, very tiny pellets. 
um, or you can go like defensive rounds, uh, which are bigger. And then eventually you go to a slug, which is like one big fat, basically like a bullet. Um, so, but if they're using, if like what I use in my shotgun for home defense are defensive rounds. And so that's only a couple big pellets that are coming out. And if you do that at close range on a limb, yeah, that limb's coming off. Yeah. But like Murphy and Lewis are reckless in this whole approach at trying to take down the gang, right? Uh, yeah. So I was watching this. I'm like, maybe the reason Detroit cops are dying at an alarming rate isn't necessarily how bad crime is in Detroit, but the fact that nobody waits for backup, like (laughs) they already know what these guys have. They've been following them on the road. They know they're outnumbered. They know they're outgunned. And then as Murphy and Lewis enter rooms, like big D again, I've never raided a house before, but I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to go into a room backward. That's, that's one thing. And maybe work as a fire team and don't split up. And then the radios, I'm like, okay, at least they, they have some way to stay in contact with her in separate rooms fucking Murphy's trying to talk to Lewis and she doesn't answer. She just groans like, so you can make audible noise. Why don't you make words? I got the vibe that, that Lewis didn't want a partner. She was eager to kill him off. She did everything she could to get him killed. Wait a minute. So you think that Lewis set Murphy up by being reckless? No, I don't think she did, but everything she did was stupid. You know, you, okay, we'll, we'll give Murphy a pass. Cause he's been at some cush, you know, suburban department where everybody says, ha ha, you don't know what being a cop is. He, he's outside of Detroit. He's like right. in the, in, in the, he's, he's where the Pistons play. Yeah. He's a mall cop. You know, he, he hasn't seen any violence. He doesn't know what's going down in old Detroit. Lewis, obviously she's lost a partner because she's getting a new one. You give him a, Hey, listen, I learned my last two partners got killed because we didn't wait for backup. Let's wait. But like, I, I, I got like the opposite feeling of their relationship. I thought that Lewis was hot for Murphy. Like, I thought she saw him. She, like, blew that big-ass bubble. Like, I felt like there was always something going on between the two of them. Like, I think is Lewis that, was that really idea hot for Alex. flirting? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, 1980s flirting. Oh, okay. Yeah, blow, it, blow it, in a dystopia bubble. Detroit. And there, there was that moment when she's kicking that suspect's ass in the police station, and she takes her helmet off, and, like, she does her hair kind of waves, and yeah. Murphy looks at her, so maybe. But... It's so much more than the violence. And as a kid, I didn't see it. Even as an adult, I didn't see it. He's making a commentary, and it works because it's hidden. In Showgirls, I was older, I saw it, but it's fucking campy. Starship Trooper was goofy and unrealistic. Yes, the satirical content's there, but I don't think it was as effective because you know what it is. I'll bet you that a majority of the audience that walked out of the theater in 87 was like, fuck yeah, woo, RoboCop, American muscle, gonna take on the criminals, yeah, fuck yeah. That's not what this movie was about. Yeah, I mean, you say you saw the same thing, uh, although it wasn't Verhoeven, you saw the same thing in uh, Rambo First Blood, right? Mm-hmm. Rambo is a post-Vietnam tragic tale of a guy who is displaced as he returns from war and can't be accepted back into society. And people are like, yeah, Rambo, <laughs> you know, fucking exploding arrows. Yeah. Could you imagine if American audiences came out of the Hurt Locker with like the same like, yeah, fuck yeah, America blowing up shit. Yeah, veterans. There's kids just getting like toy bombs to disarm from <laughs> McDonald's <laughs> Happy Meals. <laughs> They're like, mommy, mommy, I want to dress up in the bomb squad and, and have a robot for Halloween. That's what we're saying Rambo First Blood is. It's not a tale about American. It's a sad, sordid tale about the way that we abuse our veterans and don't provide the proper social services when they return to adequately fit back into society. That's what the Hurt Locker and Rambo are about. That's what we're saying. There's a connective tissue there. And explosions. Uh, And explosions. (laughs) And explosions. But yeah, he managed to take the two different big villains of the day. You had the yuppies who were trying to get rich. It was all about overconsumption. You have some of them talking about like the art of war and like how, how being in the corporate world is it's like doing battle and killing your enemy. Then you had the seedier side of like Nancy Reagan's, you know, say no to drugs, and right. that whole fight. You managed to take those two universally despised. I mean, everybody hated one of those villains. And then you pump them up with an American made cyborg police officer. Fuck yeah. Drop it, creep. Yeah, no, nobody really saw what Verhoeven was saying. Like, I guess the only thing that I would question about, like, your subtle satire um, is the overuse of cocaine. Or or is was it cocaine or was it the drug that Boddicker's gang is peddling? We never fully understand whether that's cocaine or, or something else, right? 
I'm pretty sure it's coke. Is it just cocaine? Okay, all right. Yeah, never mind. Yeah, they've. But like he's doing it, he's doing off of like breasts, which is like a total '80s thing. Like I've never done cocaine, but I imagined at one point when I was a kid playing with my RoboCop toys that eventually I would grow up to do cocaine off of two uh, women's breasts, and that still hasn't no. happened for me. No, it's a waste. You're, you're gonna lose half a ton of dress. It's like it's like in Predator Two. You remember where? What was that? Were they Colombians? And they would they yeah. would rub it on the sleeve, and then in the middle of battle, they would just sniff the sleeve. Was that was that Predator Two or was that a documentary about? No, it was Predator Two. <laughs> we talked about how how when they're raiding the facility in the beginning, and the dudes like throw a handful of coke, uh-huh. and I said it was like a road soda. Yeah, it's their go-go juice. One guy even heals with it. He's got a bullet wound, and he just packs the cocaine in there, which actually makes sense because it wouldn't hurt. So, like, uh, topical. That's good. RoboCop officially is ridding the streets of crime, but the deteriorating situation in Detroit causes the human officers to threaten to strike. Lewis, who witnesses Murphy's death, believes RoboCop is Murphy based on his exhibiting some behaviors from his old life. As RoboCop suffers from latent memories from Murphy, he discovers his true identity and that his wife and son moved away after Murphy's death. Meanwhile, Jones becomes frustrated with Morton getting promoted for his latest success with RoboCop's reputation and fearing that he will be displaced. Jones discreetly hires Boddicker to kill Morton at his home. What surprised me most about this movie, I remembered the action. I remembered the special effects. But as an adult watching it now, that tour where he goes back and starts to remember his family, that shit was dark. I actually found myself caring for him and emotionally thinking about him as a human inside the shell instead of the first time as just some action hero cop. I I felt like he was a person. Yeah. So, Gene, uh, I don't know how you feel about this, but uh, I was just thinking about this as I was watching RoboCop. You and I are significantly younger than Big D, right? Big D is like the oldest on the podcast. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. on. You know that he's going to die before we are. What if technology, like, do you think... Obviously, this movie is a, a very good predictor of future technology. Soon, like when Big D is about to die, I bet we could save his body and put him into some sort of robot to where he could continue to be on the podcast. It'd have to be fucking Ed 209 sized. <laughs> <laughs> that's, no, that's no normal sized man. Could you imagine us on the podcast recording with Robo Big D? And then like all of a sudden he starts having the convulsions. Like he starts, he's like, Emma, Vanessa, Toby. My cats. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, he doesn't need a he doesn't need a body though. We just need the head. That's it. Just, <laughs> so like the little jars, like from Futurama. He needs like two little tappers so he can edit the pod, and that's it. <laughs> that's right. Oh, editing would be a breeze with with Robo Big D. Listen, if you're <laughs> never if you're sleeps. Any, if, you're, if you're an artist out there, I will pay you a hundred dollars to draw Robo Big D. It's just gonna be Krang. <laughs> Ninja Turtles. <laughs> it's gonna be Big D. Kind of actually, Big D. Kind of looks like the body for Krang. He does. I can't believe oh, wow. you haven't done Krang for cosplay. I don't if, even know who Krang. Uh, we would is. win. We would win so many, so many awards. Is Krang like the warthog looking one? No, 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 no. no, no, no. That's, that's that's Rocksteady. That's and Rocksteady. Bebop. Yeah. We could go as Rocksteady Bebop. You could go as Krang. Yeah. And Emma could be. Uh, no, Emma would be Krang. You'd be Krang's body. Yeah. Oh, I know what you're talking about. The now. brain, Fuck you guys. the little. I know what you're talking the, about. The, the yeah, guys. I know. I know what you're doing. Fuck yeah. you both. Anyway, Big Robocop. D be, Big D would know that. Robo Big D would know. The problem that I have here is the emotional levity um, of the scene. I, I think is undercut by the the Robo Realtor. For those of you who don't remember the movie, he goes back to his old house, and like he's having flashbacks that are like playing. And he doesn't know what's real and what isn't. Sometimes he's seen his wife. Sometimes he's seen like, you know, his his son. But then they have this like TV monitor that looks like something out of like a 1980s hospital soap opera. And this guy's like, hey, would you like me to buy the house? I would buy this if there wasn't like trash that was left over. Mm-hmm. Like has like they took the time to install these real little robots, but didn't clean up like the burned photographs that are laying on the table and the yeah. dead roses. It looked like a fucking crime scene. <laughs> That's exactly right. Like he didn't die in the house. Why did they make the house all dirty? Yeah, I think it was meant to express the emotional impact on the family and the fact that because I was like, why they leave so soon? Like, it just seemed like they're like, well, he's dead. We better fucking go. Like, you're not you're not sticking around at all. Throw, throw um, some canvas over the couch. Let's get but I think it was 
I think it was meant to maximize the emotional impact. And I got to say, and this is going to get weird because I'm going to be talking about Peter Weller's mouth, but <laughs> Peter Weller, uh, I think the reason why all the other tech looks so dumb is that he's so good at what he's doing. His robotic movement is amazing. And, and as Big D said, when he has those flashbacks, you really feel for him. But think about what this guy's got to work with. He's got a big metal suit on. And the only thing he's got to really communicate with is his body language mm-hmm. and the lower half of his face. And you just feel heartbroken for him. The way he's able to emote with just that much exposure to the camera is really, really fascinating stuff. And I can't think of anybody else who could have pulled off this role. He was perfect for it. No. And if, if again, watching the behind the scenes, he studied for like three months with the head of the Juilliard department for physical movement. So he was practicing on how to move as a bird with a robot. So his head movements, when they got on set, they delivered the robot suit. He couldn't do any of the moves and he melted down. He said, I can't fucking do this. I just spent two months training for this and they started filming. It was terrible. They shut down production and gave him time to rework the movements because originally it was bad. But imagine practicing and getting ready and then the suit, you can't do anything. He could barely move. God, could you imagine tolerating the head of physical movement from the Juilliard school for two <laughs> no. months? I'd be like, get the no. fuck away from me. <laughs> uh, we're we're going to do, we're going to go for Ty tonight. No, get the, f- go away. Fuck off. He's essentially the world's head mime. You know, he's, <laughs> he's, he, he's like the mime leader and you're listening to him for two fuck. months. Yeah. Like, could you imagine? Cause Juilliard is the pinnacle of like actor and actress. Uh, movement and training in America, right? Like if you go to the Juilliard school for the dramatic arts, it's your, your, it's, it's a very tough program and you usually come out really well, right? It's well-respected. Could you imagine Peter Weller coming in that day one and being like, you know, seeing all the other actors and actresses that are, that, you know, are rehearsing their roles for Hamlet and Shakespeare and a bunch of other like literary genius. And they're like, yeah, what are you here for? Uh, I'm going to play a robot cop cyborg. Exactly. They were like, get out. (laughs) <laughs> he had to keep coming back. That's why it took two months. So what's crazy again about this movie? We talked about great lengths, the violence, uh, the uh, very there's sexuality, like there's boobs, but it's like locker room boobs, like it's not sexy. Um, but again, I can't stress this enough. This movie was turned into commercialization for little kids, and there's like a rape scene. There is a genuine assault on women that happens. That's a major scene in this movie. Yeah, it's weird because you got to figure kids who got into the RoboCop toys and cartoon would know what RoboCop was. In order to know that, you would think they would have seen right. RoboCop, but it's not a movie for kids. And I remember as a seven-year-old, this was the first time I had seen an attempted rape. I had no idea what rape was. And I'm like, what are they doing? And so then I had it explained to me and I was like, wait, people do that? Like that was a horrifying thought. Could you imagine like teachers in the 80s uh, because there was still P.E. Like you guys remember P.E. Big D, I definitely know you remember P.E. You saw it like dress out and stuff. Um, Kickball? Fuck yeah. Could could you imagine teachers in the 80s seeing two children holding down like uh, another child while um, while the teacher comes over and she's like, what is going on here? What is going on here? And then the other kid comes up and he's got a helmet on and he's like, drop it, creep. And they're like, we're just playing RoboCop, Mrs. Johnson. No, no, but you're missing it. This, it, what is the ultimate deterrent to rape? Castration. As soon as he shoots wait, that guy wait, in wait the deck, that's the that's the ultimate. Hold on. Did you see his partner in the rape? As soon as he shoots him in the dick, guy goes, "No, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry." He lays down. That dude is never attempting another single uh, assault on a woman ever again. I feel like as a military strategist, if I'm planning out a major war, why am I not He's- aiming solely for dicks? Like instead, like instead of going for headshots, we should all do dick shots. <laughs> that would end a war immediately. People would put their guns down and be like, "Yeah, you guys want to take our oil? Like, be all like, he would just don't shoot us in the dick. Like, shoot me in the head. Just demoralize an entire country by shooting their penises off." You see, folks, this is why we brought Roger Roper back <laughs> for deep yeah. hitting, fucking insightful content like this- that. <laughs> Well, aside aside from the rape, this is also the first time I'd ever seen cocaine, and I had no idea what was going on there either. So I was like, uh, "What is that stuff that they're doing?" And and I will tell you, and Mom, I'm sorry about this, but 
for weeks after RoboCop, my friends and I would go steal the powdered soap out of the uh, boys' room at school. Mm-hmm. We would snort that shit because we were like, oh, look, it's like RoboCop. So I guess it did have that effect. Would it, would, it, would you guys like take turns pouring it all over your chest and then like doing the <laughs> doing the powder off each other's chest? No, we, we tried to find incredibly old looking women to do it off of. <laughs> I don't I don't understand this about the eighties. Like, look, the it. first time I the first time I saw Playboy, it was also like an eighties Playboy. Yeah. And I'm like, why did women like hot, quote unquote hot women in the eighties look so old? Like the mm-hmm. women that are hanging out with Bob look fuck they look like moms. Like I'm like, how is this sexy? <laughs> Yeah, like, Bob, I can only be here for a couple hours. I only have the babysitter till nine. <laughs> you better get this cocaine snorting going. Fucking Bob, Karen. You're going to call me, Bob, right? God. Speaking of Bob, uh, his relationship with Dick, did it look like Dick was going to force his way? You're talking about rape. Did it Did it yeah. look like Dick was going to force his way on Bob in the executive lounge? No, but he violates that fucking rule in the bathroom. He didn't wash his hands. Not only was he there, like, getting up in his face, he doesn't wash his hand, and then he slides his hand into his oh. hair and grabs him. And mm. I thought it was that was yeah. scarier than, than fucking Emil, that clown who's like, hey, 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 hey. Bob in the bathroom with Dick? That shit was scary. Well, I mean, Dick has done this before, right? Like, he used to call his boss, like, Iron Butt Boner. <laughs> like, I'm like, I don't know, Dick. Uh... <laughs> Does it think you need some better insults there? Yeah, but he said they, they were Have always ever, with the respect. They were oh, so iron butt. That's like a, like a term of endearment. Eh, old iron butt, old boner. Robocop recognizes a gas station robber as Boddicker's henchman Emil Antonowski, and after a shootout that results in the gas station exploding and Emil being injured, he manages to arrest him. Robocop reviews police records identifies Boddicker as the other gang members before confronting them at a drug deal during his arrest Boddicker admits to being hired by Jones and with this evidence recorded on video Robocop attempts to arrest Jones at OCP Jones openly admits his role in Morton's death but reveals the fourth directive Robocop will be shut down if attempting to arrest any senior officer at OCP and with Robocop's programming limiting his abilities Jones sends in Ed 209 stationed in his office to attack Robocop Robocop manages to evade Ed 209, but is ambushed by a SWAT unit, which has all been authorized by Jones to help eliminate Robocop. Lewis, who had been following Robocop, helps him escape to safety at the steel mill and undergoes repairs. So for everybody out there, I I apologize. I'm going to talk about the military a little bit here, but I'll make it brief. Okay, so turn off the podcast. But if you think that these military mistakes or design flaws don't happen, they do. You would say, how the hell could you design a robot for urban pacification that can't walk up and down stairs? That shit happens. When I was in the army, we used, when you were doing these big training missions, it was called Miles Gear. It was like a a big glorified version of laser tech. And part of the control unit would sit on the back of your neck. And it was part of this this harness that you would wear with sensors. I know it was designed in an an air-conditioned office because... As soon as you put your rucksack on, the box was digging into the back of the the backpack. So it forced you to flip the harness around and modify it to wear the box at the front. Otherwise, you couldn't wear your other gear. So this shit is believable. They don't always field test this stuff with people who have experience. It's designed in an office and they go, oh, yeah, this will work. Listen, you don't get to a seven hundred and twenty-one trillion dollar budget by field testing stuff. You just (laughs) you just keep making that shit and throwing it out there. Yeah, I don't understand why Ed 209 also has like these great like fucking cannons, like minigun arms. And uh, his decision when he's attacking Robocop is to use essentially bottle rockets uh, that are highly inaccurate. It was like another another design flaw. But what was much more deadly than Ed 209 was the fucking Detroit Police Department when they showed up. Oh I don't God. understand. Like, these are guys that were like, yeah, Robocop like a week ago. And now they're just fucking <laughs> lighting him the fuck up. And all I'm thinking during this scene is like, this guy's already been shot to death one. If you really want to give somebody PTSD, like kill him in the same way that he was killed the first time. Like you got to decommission him after this. He is all fucked up. Yeah. If I had one bad thing to say about the plot is that this doesn't make sense because up until this point, they were striking. They were like, fuck this. Fuck OCP. They're cutting back our benefits. And now all of a sudden they're just going to take one rogue senior executive's call to arms to to destroy robocop i don't think that would happen but i guess you know again in the grand scheme of things this isn't that bad because it's supposed to be a reflection of 
what happened with Murphy and uh, a callback to that. And like police can also sometimes be the thugs and dude, dude, forget about the fact that he, yeah, he's one of us. He just captured Clarence. He just brought him in. They said, what are you going to charge him with? He's a cop killer. They brought him (laughs) in. He caught the guy that they couldn't catch. And then all of a sudden it's convenient. Uh Oh no, no. He's, he's a bad robot. Kill him. Let's get him. Come on. But that's what makes RoboCop one of the coolest <laughs> heroes of our age is that he can't win. Like he, right. he'll never he's already lost. Like even if he brings in the bad guy, even if everybody accepts him, the fact of the matter is, as you said, Big D, like he's not human anymore. He doesn't have his family. He can't go to bed at night. He's trapped in this suit. Like he's he's a revenant. He's just this thing that was brought back to to gain revenge or to seek justice and has no other purpose in life. That's, a, that's it's incredibly tragic and powerful and deep for an 80s action hero. Yeah. You're talking about there about special effects in the shootout. I think it was amazing for what they did. They had a $13 million budget, right? So you have to make a decision. Do we spend money on RoboCop? Do we spend it on world building? Do we spend it on the other robots and the fights and the explosions? And they did something smart. They said, we're never going to be able to dress up the world to make it look futuristic. They don't even fucking try. They just use the Dallas background with a couple indistinct buildings with lights at night, mm-hmm. some some rundown like iron mill. They don't even try to make it look futuristic. The cars in every other movie, Total Recall, they try to make cars look, or even like Hill Valley and Back to the Future Part 2. This, it is straight up stock off the showroom Ford Tauruses, like Ford Vans, box vans. This is 2030, and there's no car that's changed since 1987. Well, again, they had to stretch this budget because I do believe they probably blew all their cash on RoboCop itself, like the practical effects and all the explosions, right? And probably safety that went into that. When there, when you think about it, there's only, what? Well, let's count them, four maiden sets. You have the iron, you have the, the steel mill, you have OCP headquarters. You have police headquarters, and then I guess what the Murphy House, four. Yeah, can you guys think of any other major set? Well, I mean, there's like nothing major, just out on the streets. But I mean, that's then not- there's out on the street. But like, if you look at that um, scene early on when they're th- like Murph is still human as they're chasing them to the steel mill, and they throw the guy off. They're like, let's see if he can fly, and they throw him onto the car. If you that entire chase scene, there's no other cars on a Detroit highway except for those two cars. Okay, that's actually accurate because <laughs> what happened was they built Detroit anticipating a population of three times what it is. So if you're ever on the highways in Detroit, there are fucking no other cars around. There, it's really? crazy. There's no traffic. Yeah, it's pretty that's cool. crazy. But like you also, Big D, to your point though, like they didn't have any money left over to hire an actual guy that looked like he was in college. To be, to be the college boy working at the gas station. You talk about like the, the women looking older, Gene. This guy looked like he was 50 okay. studying, studying plane geometry. Okay. You know the price of college now, right? In mm-hmm. 2030, how long is it going to take a guy working at a gas station <laughs> midnight to 6 a.m. shift okay. to save up money to go you know study plane geometry? Uh, again, you're right. You're right. Yeah, he's, pro- he's probably 39 years old. But that's in world. That's not the actor. What year of a of a an aeros, aerospace engineer do you do you take plane geometry? Is he still on his first year? It's not airplane geometry. No, it's plane. P L A N E. Oh, but you're talking about like the different planes. Yeah, like yeah, of existence. An, what do you think he was designing aircraft? I I thought he was like working for Boeing or Lockheed Martin. No. Or maybe no. OCP was making a, a Ed 209 that could fly. So he was learning plane geometry. <laughs> no, plane geometry is like two-dimensional <laughs> geometry. Well, I knew it wasn't plane, P-L-A-I-N. <laughs> That's just plane geometry. That's just plane geometry. <laughs> Fuck. All right, we need another t-shirt. It's Roger Upper's plane geometry. <laughs> just vector graphics. Anyway. The police follow through with their strike, creating chaos in the city. Boddicker and his gang are released from prison and acquire new high-powered rifles from Jones to finish off RoboCop. Boddicker, utilizing a tracking system provided to him by Jones, heads to the steel mill. RoboCop and Lewis work together to eliminate the gang. Lewis, however, gets shot by Boddicker before he attacks RoboCop, who stabs Boddicker fatally in the neck. Okay, so I'm still caring about this fucking ridiculous half-human robot. (laughs) 
when, when he, it's partially because he, he's now taking his helmet off. And that right. shit looks good. That looks really good. It looks good. real good. Yeah, it looks but fantastic. He's got these, and Gene said he's got these great lips, but he's got these doe eyes. And he's just looking at everyone inquisitively. And when they drop all the steel, like, scrap on him, and it's going through his chest, I, I wanted to scream. I was like, leave him alone. Leave him alone. Leave RoboCop alone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, were the, you were the kid that got upset. You, yes. Uh, this movie I got made upset you now. Cry. Yeah. I got upset now watching it. <laughs> did Emma watch this with you or did you send her to bed? No, I put her to bed. Oh, okay. All right. If she's anything like Carrie, she put herself to bed during this movie. <laughs> but like, uh, but yeah, you, you think he's going to be overpowered. You're like, oh my God, RoboCop's going to lose because they also have like these, these super, what, what do they call them? The Cobra guns. I remember in RoboCop, the video game, if you got this gun as RoboCop, you could like destroy a lot of things. Yeah, these those cannons were fucking kick ass. And there's a great scene before they go to war with RoboCop where they're just using them out in the streets and they just get to blow shit up. It's so fun to watch. Like I'm like, man, I, I would have loved to have been on set the, the time they did the shoot again at $13 million. It's like less than than it cost to shoot the long night for Game of Thrones, right? Right. Fucking yeah. fascinating. But what I don't understand is why didn't Ed 209 have one of those? Like clearly a normal person can <laughs> carry right. it. Why does he not have one of those instead of those fucking <laughs> bottle rockets? Because you can't even pretend there he's there to arrest people. He doesn't have hands, so he can't handcuff you. If Ed shows up with that thing, but I'm sorry, if you give me like a a, a brand new, uh, some kind of rocket propelled grenade or some kind of weapon that makes things explode, I'm not shooting a car like eight feet in front of me. I want a little bit of distance. Well, it's a 6,000 sucks. So <laughs> yeah, I think it could take the damage. And also, Big D, you're not a, a fucking Detroit hoodlum that's that's uh, coked up and freshly out of prison, like a meal. So yeah. I don't know. And speaking of a meal, speaking of a meal, <laughs> like you know, like I I thought he died. I thought, and then he and then he's back in the, in the scene with the with the big cannons that they're shooting off, and he's also at the steel mill. Yeah. So well, Robocop arrests him, and then he, he gets out again. But then he a, a horrible fate awaits him as he gets hit by the toxic waste guys again. It's one of those things I'd never seen before. I hadn't seen rape. I hadn't seen cocaine. I didn't know what toxic waste was. And so I saw this and I was horrified. And as a child, anytime I heard of anything being toxic, I was like, oh, shit, like get that fucking away from me. (laughs) Yeah, because it pours on a meal and like completely instantly mutates his ass. Yeah, you'll eventually either become mutated like Emil does or you'll 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 gain uh, superhero senses (laughs) And then, uh, but you'll be blind, but your hearing will be so great that you'll fight crime in, in Hell's Kitchen in New York. But it gives us one of the, the understated quotes of the movie. Early on when there's the massacre in the boardroom, I think Dick says, oh, it's just, it's just a glitch. It's just a glitch. And you have someone screaming, get the paramedics. No, I don't think that'll work. Here, Emil, he's, his flesh is it's melting off of his bones. And yeah. he's like, help me. Help me. What the fuck? Who's going to help you? <laughs> What could they do to help you? He looks like that poor soldier or uh, uh, fireman in in Chernobyl, late <laughs> laying in bed. Oh, it's so bad. Spoiler but then alert. the wor- the worst is when um, was it RoboCop? Oh, no, it's it was a Boddicker. Who who runs him over? Oh, Boddicker. Had Someone some. runs him over. Boddicker runs him over. He explodes. Oh. Yeah, that's that's well, one of the highlights. Softened up. He's all the toxic waste do that. It just softens your bones to where you become this meat pie that just explodes in intestines and arms and eyeballs flying everywhere. I mean, I think it's it's kind of like when it's kind of like zombies and The Walking Dead, how they just become very mushy for no reason. Yeah. Toxic Waste Flea is definitely a highlight in this movie. I remember in the version that I watched as a kid and, and, and I may have gotten it wrong, but I thought his like as he's like coming out of it, like one of his arm falls off. Like, does that happen? Like his hand like drops. It didn't in, in the version that I watched in RoboCop. Yeah. Doesn't his arm drop no. as he's trying to like find people to help him and then he explodes. No, no that's a different movie. I have not seen. I, I watched the trailer for part two. No, I will not be watching it. Part three. No, I did not watch the reboot. So that could be in one of the other movies, but right. that was not in this. But I think we all have to stand up and just just applaud. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This movie was was made on thirteen million dollars. They filmed yeah. it in Dallas in August. It was between one hundred and thirty. And 135 degrees inside. Oh my, Peter oh was my losing three pounds a day. He was getting dehydrated. He had an IV. 
This movie, people on the set have gone on record as saying this is their worst experience ever. I think one of the executives had said, I will never do another movie again. One of the writers had sworn off Hollywood. This was a true test of people's determination and that they got through it, through all of the problems, the hiccups, the shutdowns, that we got a movie that still 30 some odd years later kicks ass. It's a testament to their willpower. Yeah, the it's it's funny too because this movie did inspire other similar type movies. Like they totally when Boddicker is he's approaching RoboCop, he's got the steel beams on him, Big D's crying in the corner. He takes that steel <laughs> that steel pole and yeah. he shoves it down into where like RoboCop's heart would be if he was still human, but he's not. He's a RoboCop. Um that scene is lifted. James identical. Cameron it's the identical scene identical. in Terminator 2. Yeah. So like James Cameron, you're a hack, and I don't know why Avatar is still number one. I agree. Hack. Yeah. Yeah. Robocop heads to OCP headquarters alone, destroying Ed 209. He barges in on an executive meeting where Old Man and Jones are present and shows him the video of Jones's confession. Jones quickly takes the Old Man hostage, knowing that the fourth directive still protects him. The Old Man fires Jones, nullifying the protection and allowing Robocop to shoot Jones, who falls out of a window to his death. Grateful, the Old Man commends Robocop shooting and asks what his name is. Robocop smiles and answers, Murphy, end movie. Uh, another great quote from the movie is when uh, when you see that Lewis has been shot and she's like, you know, and Robocop goes to her and he's like, they'll fix you. They yeah. fix everything. And I'm like, wow, that's dark as shit. And then we never see Lewis again. And like, a- a- as I'm watching this, I'm like, fuck, I don't remember what happens in Robocop 2. I'm like, please don't tell me that because this is what Hollywood would do today. Robocop 2 would be Lewis as Miss Robocop. Right. And uh, and later we find out, no, she's fine. And then in Robocop 3, they would have a family of robo children that would also fight crime and they'd be the robo family. And then they have a children's show with puppets and call it Robo Bop. <laughs> for- <laughs> Dude, imagine though, this could have gone fucking super dark. What imagine now if Lewis looks at Murphy when he says they fix everything? If she's like, no, no, and he goes, they'll fix everything. <laughs> and then it cuts to a fucking scene and Robocop was actually more cyborg the whole time. And then you have yeah. Robo Lewis. That shit yeah. would be fucking wild. But there's more that's going on here in just this fight scene of, you know, Robocop killing uh, Jones and, and Jones falling off. There's almost like a redemption, like an exploration of like what, what it means to be human. Yeah, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. There's actually some religious component to this that I wouldn't. If you told me, yeah, you know, there's some biblical uh, parallels to this movie. I'd say, what are you crazy? But I found an interview with Paul Verhoeven where he said, and this is Paul. So don't don't come at me with this. Paul is a Dutch director, and he's making a commentary on American society. This is not me. This is Paul Verhoeven. Paul said, there's some Jesus in RoboCop. You can't have the resurrection without the crucifixion. At the end, when Murphy is walking on water, he tells Clarence, I'm not arresting you anymore. The time for peaceful resolution is past. He's now become an American Jesus. Because even as Jesus came to the end, he said, let the ones who has not swords sell his cloak to buy one. He was drawing a parallel between Jesus Christ and RoboCop and that Americans love their guns and that in the end, much like Jesus, RoboCop was going to use the sword to dispense justice. Yeah, and there's that uh, entire episode dedicated on American Gods. You can check it out on our review on chatontv.com. I feel like I want to add a wipe just for that. (laughs) I thought Verhoeven was German, but he's Dutch. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, that's the movie. Now's the time of the podcast (laughs) where we break out our chat meters and give you our wipe scores. If you've never listened to the podcast, Zero Wipes is taking the mutilated dead corpse of a fallen police officer and turning him into the ultimate robo cop American Jesus. Uh, and five wipes is ramming your, your air Ford Aerostar van into a toxic waste container and then exploding across a uh, Toyota Celica that some Iranian kid in the back is uh, making woo, 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 woo <laughs> sounds. Uh, so zero wipes is good. Five wipes is bad. We'll start with you, Gene. How many wipes do you give this movie? Uh, Raj for me, you know that I hate 
comedy in a non-comedy movie, but this movie did just the right amount of comedy and it used it for a very specific purpose. So it was an onslaught of violence and just slamming the senses. So you needed that bit of comedy to let you catch your breath because there were points where I, I forgot to breathe. And again, this is today. This is 30 years after the movie came out. Uh, the movie's terrifyingly accurate in its predictions of the future without being overly cerebral. It's and Carrie's going to hate me for even saying this, but it's it's what I wanted from Blade Runner. Just appeal to my emotion and keep the story moving very, very quickly. Uh, it's also a truly painful tale. I, I remember when we covered The Crow, they had that scene where they're showing like when The Crow died, and you're like, oh, you're supposed to think it's very traumatic. That was bullshit compared to RoboCop. Like They <laughs> hit you hard with this shit. Yeah. Um, that mix of the surgery scenes and then Murphy's memories of his life was super powerful. And I thought, you know, you guys mentioned the their take on technology. The computer effects are really tastefully done. They had the simple LED screen, the status codes, uh, the special effects otherwise were incredible. When RoboCop takes off his helmet, it, it looks great. Um, I like that they had a partnership with Lewis. And even if she had the, the hot serum a little bit, it wasn't like sexual. It wasn't a romantic tale. And that was fairly advanced for the late 80s. It would still mainly, you know, if you look at movies like Conan the Barbarian and other movies of the 80s uh if you had a male and a female working together at all it ended up being romantic in some way the only thing i would give a ding for is some of the explaining i had to do to myself for all the things that you had to suppose for this world to exist right like it's not a hundred percent on target so i'd say just a little bit of a ding for that uh like the fact that uh robocop was released out on the street so quickly like it was just like Come on. <laughs> no testing just <laughs> like right. yeah. go ahead on his own too just like okay no partner now just go ahead uh, so, or like just the lack of investigation of the Ed 209 incidents that could be explained away a little bit, but you know, not entirely. So for me, uh, I'm going to have to go half a wipe on this one. Still a spectacular movie and one that I would literally turn around and watch right now. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with you, Gene, this movie, you do have to fill in the blanks a little bit, but I think that that plays to its credit because it's a surprisingly tight B movie. And it holds up for what it attempts to pull off, right? Like you said, it's the Nostradamus of 80s action movies that's surprisingly deep in its satire when you look just beneath the surface. That, and it ultimately became ironic, again, when the producers commercialized the property even further, just like Paul Verhoeven predicted us dumb Americans would do. But ultimately, at the end of the day, my rating is it's a fun movie. It holds up. The fact that they didn't try to go to last starfighter and they didn't try to go to um tron with its visual effects i think the simplicity of it like the predator and the terminator and terminator 2 they don't look outdated does that make sense like they still look yep. good yeah which is great and so i think that's why this movie continues to hold up plus there's this whole deeper conversation of like big mega corporations coming into cities that have failed like the league of shadows and Ra's al Ghul and Batman and depressing the area with crime and working in conjunction with drugs and, and, and crime and they're in on it so they can depress the, the property uh, so that they can build their city and ultimately rule the world. That's what's happening here in RoboCop. But all anyone ever remembers is drop it creep and uh, dicks being blown off. So uh, this movie is a fascinating exploration into how action movies in the 80s can become iconic warnings 30 years later. Um, and for that, it's it's a half a wipe for me. I agree with you. This is a fucking great movie. And by the way, um, quick plug for the Dana Buckler show. Ashley Schlafly goes into like a professorial six layers deep tangent on this movie it's it's fascinating and dana does a real good background on uh on the movie so check that out so knowing ashley fairly well i'm gonna guess she didn't discuss the dick shooting i don't think so well she talked about the the metaphors behind and like the over commercialization that led to the dick shots that's right so gene you had said something that really struck a chord with me that you found yourself not over questioning one of the complaints we get from new listeners, uh, we received an email recently where somebody goes, how could you guys not like a Christmas story? You guys are taking this shit too fucking serious. Don't overanalyze. We overanalyze only when it doesn't make sense or it's not a good movie. Christmas yeah. story is not that good. This, I don't give a shit. The investigation of Ed 209, I don't even care. The fact that you're out there, that you have a, a 
a, a couple murders in a boardroom, nobody's questioning that. It's all good Mm-mm. because the yeah. movie has done a good enough job to build the world. And yeah. the 80s were without a doubt. It was the height of that violent R-rated, you know, buff American meat superhero, the Schwarzenegger. Mm. Even though he's not, he's American now. You know, yeah. the Rambos, the Terminators. And this movie looks like it's just one of those. It's just the, the, the muscle-bound hero throws out the funny one-liners, the stupid villain. RoboCop looks not too different from that. But when you get below the surface, it is a great social commentary on Reagan-era America. It, it, it really does something that a lot of other movies can't do. At the day, it was very successful because it was, fuck yeah, America action, and kids loved it. And today, going forward, hopefully those same adults go back and watch it and see what was going on beneath the surface. But for me, w- without a doubt, it is a half wipe. I enjoyed it surprisingly. It flew by. The acting was great. The special effects were done well. They didn't try to over predict the future. Yeah. And I think because of that, it really works. Half wipe. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, G- uh, Gene and, and Big D, I know you recorded this with Carrie. What was her <laughs> score? What did she give this? Oh, I don't know. Let's it say. wasn't good. Seven wipes. I don't know. Let me say. It was. I, I think. I mean. I think it was in the in the fours. I think. Interesting. Uh, here, hold on. I, I have it. I have it. Hold on. Let's see. Uh, Carrie was a three point seven five wipe. Wow. She said, "God damn it, another Verhoeven flick." We just renewed Total Recall <laughs> not too long ago, and touching. Yeah, she was not a Verhoeven fan. Three point seven five. Interesting. I don't know. Did she see all the social commentary just beneath the surface? You know, but I think it is fair okay, to include her score. Oh, yeah. No, I, I definitely agree. I, I definitely agree. I mean, because I, I don't mean to, like, discredit the pantheon of Shat, but, like, what other movies have we done that are half a wipe? Uh, okay. So so in the pantheon of Shat, there have been a total of 10 movies that are half a wipe or better, but the only parallel to half wipes is Edward Scissorhands and Aliens. I think this is better than Edward Scissorhands. I, I agree with you, but I think we have to include carries. I think we have to. Okay, so if we were to add up half a wipe scores for the three of us, plus carries 3.75 wipe score, what does that average out to, Gene? That would be 1.31 wipes for RoboCop. Wow, 1.31. That's still a pretty good score, but Big D, where does that place it in our rankings, which you can find on our website, shatthemovies.com? Yeah, shatthemovies.com forward slash rankings. So this is movie 111, and with a 1.31, that now ties it uh, in the 29 spot with Breakfast Club, Shawshank Redemption, The Matrix, uh, Last Action Hero, and Total Recall, another Verhoeven classic. So it's it's in that zone. Not the bottom, but a little bit towards the top. I, I think this feels right. I'm, I mean, I'd rather watch this than Edward Scissorhands, but... I, I get why Edward Scissorhands was rated the way that it was on this podcast. So that being said, I think it, I think it feels right. Yeah, I think Edward Scissorhands more on artistic merit. This is more on enjoyability factor. But I think ultimately what we're going to end up doing is just having this big bulge in the middle <laughs> of movies that we're <laughs> like, right. yeah, this feels right. It's about the same <laughs> as the other hundred movies that we watch. That's right. <laughs> is it st- statistical regression? Um, eventually, the more and more you test something, everything comes to the center and the mean I think it's plain geometry plain, yeah, sure. it's p-l-a-i-n it's just plain yeah. geometry yeah. all right well that does it for this week's uh episode of shat the movies be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend we're everywhere including snapchat twitter and instagram just follow the handle at shat the movies our facebook site is shatthemovies.com forward slash Facebook. Website is shatthemovies.com. Our email address where you can send us your suggestions for upcoming categories is hosts at shatthemovies.com. If you want to support the podcast, it's shatthemovies.com forward slash PayPal or forward slash Venmo. You can also shop on Amazon. Just go to shatthemovies.com forward slash Amazon and you can browse and make your purchases all on Amazon and we will get uh, a few pennies here or there to, to mm-hmm. keep up with our web hosting services and all of that. Um, you can also complete the survey shatthemovies.com forward slash survey uh, to where we will. It's all anonymous, uh, your responses, but it will help us go find some sponsors. The last thing we ever want to do here at chat on entertainment is put anything behind a paywall. So make sure you 
complete the survey so that we can go get some uh, mid rolls and you can just skip ahead. Also check out again, our sister podcast chat on TV, where we review television series. You can find that at chat on TV.com on behalf of my co-host, big D Dick Ebert, Gene ed 209 lions. I'm Roger Roper. Be sure to check us out on the next podcast for the following movie. Listen to the trailer. Thank you to Carrie gross. Thank you to King B. Thank you guys for allowing me to come back and record this with you. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for listening. Take care. Good night and good luck. Grandfather's here. Can't you tell me I'm sick? I'll pinch my cheek. I hate that. Maybe he won't. Hey, how is this sick? Huh? I brought you a special present. What is it? It was the book my father used to read to me when I was sick, and I used to read it to your father. And today, I'm going to read it to you. It was a time when life didn't seem so complicated. Marriage is what brings us together today. What? 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 I'm killing myself once we reach the honeymoon suite. Wouldn't that be nice? Hmm? A courtly age. Of gentle conversation. I won't always come for you. But how can you be sure? This is true love. Oh, no. Is this a kissing book? No. Actually, there was a lot of treachery, peril, and revenge. Prepare to die. Never go in against the Sicilian when death is on the line! <laughs> there were affairs of state. But I've got my country's 500th anniversary to plan, my wedding to arrange, my wife to murder, and Gilda to frame for it. I'm swamped. And affairs of the heart. My Wesley will always come for me. Your Wesley is dead. I've seen worse. Bye bye, boy. Have fun storming the castle. It's more than turning. What's the difference? We've got him. Think it'll work? It would take a miracle. Bye bye. It's a story of love, a tale of adventure. It's as real as the feelings you feel. I'm kissing again. Someday you may not mind so much. The Princess Bride. Not just your basic, average, everyday, ordinary, run-of-the-mill, ho-hum fairy tale. 